But at the same time, because his father was concerned that maths didn't make make money, he was also studying um, chemical engineering at the ETH in Switzerland. And, and it's worth saying here that um, Einstein would sit the same entrance exam that von Neumann did for the ETH, but would fail it. <laughs> but uh... Hi, I don't know. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, sort of slightly nervous about this, but also you're nervous about this. Nervous. You're nervous, yeah, about a, this? a little bit, a little bit. Uh, yeah, I hope well, you, you don't know. get any serious publicity. That would be traumatizing. <laughs> well, you know, the Moral Animal was one of my favorite books growing up. So oh well, uh, that? you're you're too kind. Uh, you, you've ensured yourself favorable treatment for the rest of this conversation. That was very Excellent. clever. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I had to learn a bit about game theory myself. We, so, you know. Yeah, well, you're just the kind of thing a clever game theorist would do. We'll get to that because, uh, well, let me, let me introduce both of us. I'm Robert Wright. This is a non-zero podcast. I published a non-zero newsletter. You are on no uh science writer. And we're going to talk about your book on John von Neumann who invented game theory, among other things, who was arguably the most important thinker of the 20th century, arguably the smartest person of the 20th century. Now, Time Magazine selected Albert Einstein as person of the century. I'm guessing that if you had been editor of Time Magazine 23 years ago, we might have seen a different person on the cover. Is that, is that true? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> um, well, if I knew, had known then what I know now, then yes, but uh, probably at the time not. Um, but yeah, um, I think somebody else actually did choose. I think the Financial Times did choose Is that right? Norman as person of the century, if I remember correctly. Some newspaper did, yeah. So An another another sign of superior British taste, uh, I guess you would say. Um, so if you if you had to say in just one sentence uh, why he deserves so much respect. Uh, you know, and it started off John von Neumann, and maybe the first thing could be invented game theory, comma, 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 for as long as you want. Uh, what what roughly would that sentence sound like? Wow. Well, um, so he invented game theory. Um, the thing that I'm talking to you on um, runs on the von Neumann architecture. So the outline of a programmable computer. Um, yeah, and, and even if people are listening on a smartphone, that's still true. That, that's yep. a von Neumann architecture. That's too. a von Neumann architecture. The first, <clears throat> uh, the first computer simulation, that was him. The first computerized weather forecast. Um, oh, uh, you, you could arguably say he was the godfather of the open source movement. Um, more technically, if we go to quantum mechanics, he was around at the crucial juncture where... Uh, Quantum mechanics was born and he laid down the first uh, mathematically rigorous version of quantum mechanics. And that formulation in Hilbert space, that's still true today. It's still the most rigorous. Uh, yeah, game theory, um, the bomb. Um, Oppenheimer called him in because uh, he, he needed help. And uh, mm -hmm. he helped and made a decisive contribution to the Fat Man Bob. Uh, the America's um, ICBM program. Uh, he kick-started that because he realized the Soviets were ahead in um, developing hydrogen bombs small enough. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. Uh, the first proof that uh, machines can reproduce themselves. I think uh, we're going to see some fruits of that one in the next few years. As well. Yeah. He also made fundamental contributions to mathematics. I think that's the thing we'll have to give short shrift uh, just because it's the hardest to comprehend and uh the most obscure, but but no less important. It has to do with set theory and uh, a, a, a problem that Bertrand Russell was famously wrestling with, a paradox uh, and, the, and the kind of the foundations of mathematics. The um, So the book, I've seen two subtitles. The title is The Man from the Future. I've seen The Visionary Ideas of John von Neumann, The Visionary Life of John von Neumann. Explain this paradox. Which one, uh, which one is it? Um, well, yeah, um, it's very much a book about know. ideas. Yeah. Yeah, as you may know, the level of control a writer has um, over the um, the subtitle of their first book is is fairly minimal. So, <clears throat> Penguin were great in that they recognised and supported um, the the Man from the Future as a title, which some other publishers were very wary about. Um, 
but um, it, I, I knew from the beginning when I pitched it, this was a case that it wasn't really going to be a straight biography. And it isn't. It, it's really about the origin and influence of von Neumann's ideas. So I think the second subtitle, which was chosen by Norton for the, um, for the uh, US paperback, I think that's mm-hmm. kind of more accurate. There is a straight and that's biography. Which, that's which one for the paperback? The visionary ideas of. Ideas. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little more apt. It, it, it's very, um, it's more about the ideas than a traditional biography would be, or at least the ratio of ideas to life. You know, there's enough in there to get to know him, uh, but it's largely about the ideas, you know, very concisely presented. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very efficient way to uh, find yourself thinking about a lot of different things. Um, Talk before we get into his uh, his various ideas, um, and I mean it, it is amazing. For example, you didn't even mention the cellular automaton. Uh, he he co- he in, he co invented that. that. That's this maybe it's slightly obscure, but but my first book spent like the first third of it, three scientists and their gods, on this guy who thought had a digital view of physics and thought the universe fundamentally is a computer, and and it was a, specifically a cellular automaton. And he's like, and that's an idea that's kind of out there. And it's just something von Neumann kind of tossed off inventing this thing called a cellular automaton in which people can look up. If they want. So it is, I, I, I was aware of von Neumann, but I had no idea of kind of the scope of his contribution. So uh, why don't you start out talking just a little bit about kind of where he comes from? Yeah, so he's born in um, 1903. Um, he's Jewish Hungarian. He's born in Budapest, which is very much a boomtown then, and uh, it's also culturally a a boomtown. His family is is wealthy. His father's um, an investment banker who is uh, a lawyer, um, highly respected, and uh, that's that's where they get the von in their name, which is a sign of sort of nobility there, given that title. Um, So he's born into this kind of gilded, really, surroundings, but even so, pretty early on, from about the age of four or five, it's it's very obvious to everybody that he's a he's a genius. He's a child prodigy of the highest possible caliber. I mean, he can do all sorts of mental gymnastics, mental mental mathematics with uh, with with large numbers, um, <clears throat> and um, it becomes quite clear that his his main strength is mathematics. Although he has a photographic memory. He plows through 20 volume histories of the world in in German, um, you know, when he's eight or nine um, and leaves little notes in the margins. I I did the same thing, by the way. I'm not I'm not impressed by that. I did. I did. (laughs) Well, uh, yeah, on his deathbed, he was still able to recite pages and pages of of those books. And Tale of Two Cities was another favorite of his. And he can recite uh, much of that. Yeah. Yeah. Just later on. And so um, his his father's sort of investing in all these companies, and um, he he uh, he's one of three brothers, and uh, he's the he's the eldest, and um, he brings these sorts of uh, he brings his work home with him. Essentially, his business partners uh, will rock up, and he'll invite his sons to lunch. He he treats treats them very very much like sort of mini adults, and involves them in in his various business decisions. And so von Neumann is brought up in this environment where um, the world and business and money, that, that matters, right? And I think that's one thing that makes him very different from the sorts of mathematicians um, you'll often read about elsewhere. He, mm. he wasn't really an ivory tower sort of guy. Um, he really liked to engage with the world. And, and that's why, although his pure maths was important, it was incredibly important, um, I think his contributions where he, uh, his math sort of made an impact on the world is, is what I chose to focus on. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay. Let's, um, and as you say, he was very much engaged in the world. You mentioned the Manhattan Project. He was something of, a, of an activist uh, uh, and, and was, after World War II, extremely concerned about the Soviet Union, even to the point of wanting to launch a preemptive strike against their, uh, I guess, a nuclear strike against their nuclear weapons. And I want to um, uh, I, I want to talk about that before we get through. Uh, but let's um, 
let's start about at the uh, kind of more more uh, scientific and less kind of technological and, and applied end of it. Uh, and and again, let's skip the math. That was his first great contribution, I guess, was was to set theory. But um, and let's talk about the quantum physics. So the uh, I I didn't really I wasn't really aware of this that there were when he kind of showed up they were just trying to make sense of quantum physics and they had these two different mathematical approaches to it heisenberg's matrix approach and the famous schrodinger equations and he showed that those two were the same and formally right he formally showed that fun, that those they were both uh saying the same thing mathematically right yeah that that's that's exactly right i think um <clears throat> Um, it, obviously, yeah. Well, I don't. I I do want to not necessarily dwell on masses of mathematics, but it is worth saying that the first sure. set of problems that he dealt with as a teenager were were these paradoxes that you were talking about that Russell and others had brought to mind. And what he did there was he helped sort of not really solve the problem, but he he created a sort of bridge over it. And this dealing with mathematical logic, this kind of cutting his teeth in mathematical logic did, I think, inform the way that he approached all problems, really, in future. And that is, he would sort of break down these complex, seemingly intractable problems into the language of sort of mathematical logic. And then his brain just could bulldoze the, his, you know, his way through it. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> for him, I guess, he arrives in Göttingen when he's, um, I think, 22. Um, he's finished his PhD uh when he's uh well i think he had a draft of it when he was 17 as a teenager so this is a university in 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 germany so uh where was he no so he got his phd from the university of budapest but at the same time because okay. his father was concerned that maths didn't make make money he was also studying um chemical engineering at the eth in switzerland and and it's worth saying here that oh. Um, Einstein would sit the same entrance exam that von Neumann did for the ETH, but would fail it. <laughs> but, uh, but von Neumann, uh, von Neumann managed to get into the ETH, even though chemistry wasn't really his, uh, his, uh, his strength. Um, so then, you know, he turns up, um, having finished his PhD to Göttingen. And the reason he's there has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. He's there because David Hilbert, who is the preeminent mathematician of the day, that's um, mm -hmm. his uh, math department. And at the same time that von Neumann arrives by, by a huge coincidence, Heisenberg is also there. And Heisenberg's a year older than him, 23, and he's developed, yeah, matrix mechanics, which is the kind of first take on, on quantum mechanics. And a year later, whilst von Neumann's still there, there's this other version um, by Schrodinger from um, Vienna. And these two versions seem to give the right answers they both seem to give the same answers but um they offer very fundamentally different views of what's kind of going on um mm -hmm. in reality now we know now that really the maths um is, is ultimately it's, it's all we have in a way when you start looking for the meaning of quantum mechanics things become very hotly debated and um and controversial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we're having to grapple with meaning now as we get to the age of quantum computing to, to see what the limits really, really are. But, mm. but at the time, you've got these two um, distinctly different um, looking beasts. And one of them, matrix mechanics, is all about sort of electrons jumping about from one level uh, in, a, in an atom to another. Um, and it's all sort of discontinuous. And then you have um, Schrodinger's version where you've got sort of smoothly varying waves. Now, what were these waves describing? Well, they turn out to be sort of probability waves that describe the probability of um, an electron being somewhere in space. But, you know, people didn't know that um, at the time and, and um, didn't really make, you know what to, what to make of these things. And so when von Neumann turns up, uh, what he does is he takes a close look at the maths of all of this. And he shows, he, he sort of proves um, using um, what's called the Hilbert space formulation, uh, although really von Neumann became, an, even though his mentor Hilbert had uh, first 
sort of invented the space, von Neumann becomes the world's leading expert. And uh, he formulates quantum mechanics in Hilbert space. And uh, that Hilbert space formulation of quantum mechanics is still uh, considered the most rigorous uh, version of uh, quantum mechanics that, that you can get. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, first of all, it, it, one interesting question that kind of came up in my mind reading the book is the role of contingency in, in kind of history and intellectual history. I mean, obviously, he was a genius. He's on his own level. But had he not encountered Hilbert, you kind of wonder, like, what would his range of contributions been? Because Hilbert's ideas played a role more than once in, in his uh, kind of seeing things clearly. And Hilbert, by the way, if, if there's anyone who had a shot at relativity other than Einstein, who was closing in on it other than Einstein, you would say it was probably Hilbert. So he, he's like this, uh, a nice guy to encounter if you're some genius uh, looking for uh, inspiration and 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 very wise counsel. So let me ask you a question about this uh, the quantum thing. So Schrodinger has this kind of wave depiction of what's going on, but this was now I gather that later we came to think. Uh, I mean, this was before the famous two slits experiment, right? Where uh, you shoot electrons through these two slits, and you, and you see if you look at the way at the interference pattern, it looks like there's really a physical you could describe them as like physical waves, right? I mean, that's my understanding. But at this point, they didn't even have that degree of empirical reason to think that maybe in some sense what we've been calling is a, a particle is a wave. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in wave-particle duality, gosh, um, I think they did um, have, you know, indications of that that um they could be um you know physically both could be true you know particles could uh -huh. be waves and they could be particles but yeah i think i think that's i think that's fair it wasn't you know it wasn't um well understood at the time mm -hmm. and and this was definitely so, the time that uh, it was all being watched. okay uh in any event that's the one of the fundamental paradoxes at the heart of of uh quantum physics, um, there were these two, two things that were both doing a good job of predicting what would happen in physical systems at the quantum level. Uh, and, and von Neumann showed formally they were the same, they were the same thing. So he, 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 he created kind of a meta foundation of these two foundational things. Yeah. And then he goes on a few years later to write his big book, um, Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. And there he sort of unpacks mathematically, again, for the first time, this idea of um, wave function collapse, you know. So what happens when you make an, a, an observation? What does it mean really to make an observation on a quantum mechanical system? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it um, when you say, uh, you look at something under a microscope, is that you know, is the microscope making the observation and, you know, uh, or is it, you know, the human eye or is it somewhere in, in you know, the human consciousness? Mm -hmm. And what he shows mathematically, at least, is that you can make what he called the cut at any point along this sort of uh, linear sort of chain of events. And the mathematics works out, right? And, um, but it, by, by doing that, he's, he sort of, broaches this question of you know it, it really clarifies this, this question of you know what is going on what do we think is is really going on here and what does it mean to make a more you know a, a, an observation and there are modern answers to that question which i don't think we have time to discuss which i, I no, but uh, it, but that but that was a that was a really interesting part of the book to me because i was not aware of the, that von Neumann had, had laid it out this way. And, and just to set the context a little more, you know, quantum physics, uh, there's this idea that when you measure the electron, you find out, okay, it's here. But if you ask, where was it right before you measured it? Uh, it's not clear that there's even in principle an answer to that. that uh, you know, uh, all you can say right before you measure it is, well, it has a 30% chance of being here or a 20% chance here. And, and that distribution of probabilities is the wave that then collapses upon measurement. And according to standard quantum interpretation of all this, 
it isn't just that you don't know until you measure it. It's that there is no, the electron is nowhere or the electron is everywhere. It's in superposition. This is one of the weirdest things of quantum physics. And what von Neumann did, I now realize, was he did this kind of thought experiment. He said like, well, I should add, uh, there's, there's controversy over like, okay, what collapses the wave function exactly? What is it about measure, quote, measurement that, that makes reality assume definite form, kind of? And uh, the answers range from, well, it has to hit a measuring device to uh, it just has to hit anything macroscopic or so something, something even less refined than a measuring device to at the other end, it's human consciousness. And at that point, you get into this weird philosophical stuff with kind of an Eastern flavor, a kind of, you know, there's a longstanding idea in Indian philosophy that the mind brings the physical world into existence and so on. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of von Neumann's uh, friends and contemporaries, Eugene Wigner, I think, uh, messed around with that, took that very seriously. Um, but but what I want to say is just that I had never before, I didn't know that von Neumann laid the problem out. Like he said, imagine you're here, there's a thermometer in some boiling water or something there, there's some, something being measured. Where is the collapse happening? And he gives these various possibilities. He says, well, it could be like at the retina, at the this, at the that. And one of the things he says is at the extreme end of the options he offers is the cutoff point could be at the, at the level of the quote, abstract ego. And I like, I wondered like, does he mean consciousness by that? Is, is, is he flirting with this super weird idea with that or i mean i guess he doesn't say right he just uses yeah. the phrase abstract ego exactly but that is, that is what he means by that i mean it's it's von neumann talk for sort of consciousness but i don't i think he remains agnostic about it i'm not sure how much unlike his his friend his school friend actually Wigner, um i think he tended to take a fairly pragmatic uh approach to quantum but he, he just wanted to set it out and show you know there is a there is a sort of problem there, and he wanted to show it very clearly. It arises in the maths. This is how you sort sort of solve this problem mathematically, and you can kind of kind of ignore it if you like. Um, I mean, it still works, but there is still you know a problem there. Um, so yeah, and I think um, the reason that that you you didn't know about this problem, and many other people didn't, despite is is because von Neumann's name very rarely appears in uh, most sort of popular science. Uh, books on on quantum mechanics because he's he's sort of that's so right. open because right. people don't want to talk about maths right um, they want to they, they you know they want to talk about the physical principles and things like that but they don't want to um, necessarily talk about um, how the maths really is all, all important because everything builds on that and you know it's it's tough to to explain the maths so let's uh, let's just uh, pass that one by and and this this. This isn't helped by the fact that, you know, I, I did a physics undergraduate degree and you don't really learn about von Neumann there, although you do mention the Hilbert space um, uh, approach uh, to quantum. What you're interested in as a physicist is, is kind of solving problems, right? And in that context, you can either use matrix mechanics um, or you can use um, wave mechanics. And most of the time you, you, you'll use Schrodinger because physicists are very used to dealing with like wave equations and things like that. So that comes very naturally. Whereas matrix, you know, matrices are you know, pretty hairy things to sort of have to deal with. But you know, when you're talking about, say, the spins of um, electrons, um, it turns out that matrix mechanics is, is, uh, is easier to use. So you know, for physicists who aren't really interested in grappling with the... Uh, Kind of the fundamentals of uh, the philosophy of quantum mechanics. It's like, well, you know, why does von Neumann even matter? But uh, that his contributions have more recently sort of um, come to light again as as kind of physicists and people who have become interested in quantum uh, computing. They've started looking again at, at foundations. So um, yeah, his name's appearing more and more often, which is another reason why I wrote the book. Yeah. The uh, another thing in the quantum realm I wasn't aware of was that he in some ways was, well, well, either the first or one of the first people. Tell me if I've got this wrong, but one of the first people to point to the even if implicitly the phenomenon of entanglement 
b- by which we mean, uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the way some people would put it is that uh, by measuring something, uh, a particle here, you can, in some sense, influence the state of a particle, you know, lo- far, far away instantaneously. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. He said, he, he considered it kind of reductio ad absurdum of quantum physics, like this couldn't be the case, right? Well, it turns out experimentally, I think we've established it can be the case. I, I, I'm not sure you would put it the way I've put it. You seem to be a little more careful in your phrasing. But anyway, entanglement is a super weird thing one way or the other, right? And, and, and why don't you give me your rendering of it and tell me, am I right that uh, there's some sense in which he was he was uh, one of the first people to point to it? Um, yeah, now, I think so. Gosh, it's been a while since I've written that that section. But I think what you see in um, mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics is uh, the first sort of truly mathematical description of this phenomenon and, um, uh, you know, sort of showing how it appears quite naturally. So when you're looking at, um, this experimental setup you were talking about where you've got, you know, beaker of hot water, you've got the thermometer, you've got um, the observer, a microscope and so on. Um, you know, you can view this, uh, von Neumann showed, as a, an entangled system. It's all, all of the, um, the elements are kind of the wave functions of all the uh, elements are inextricably linked with each other. But again, he, he sort of shows that the mass still all works out. We don't need to worry too much. You don't need to worry about whether A or B is entangled. So, yeah, you know, he, he sort of, um, he, he lays that out and it, it's a bit reassuring, although we've found since that um, there are some um, repercussions to all of this that uh, uh, von Neumann uh, really didn't consider and couldn't have considered at, at the time. When, when you start dealing with more and more complex systems, things start to get extremely um, strange. But... Um, yeah, I think I think the the thing that um, everybody, all the physicists, are going to be screaming at me to to mention is that entanglement doesn't mean that you can pass information uh, faster than right. light, right? So um, it's really a correlation, um, if you like, between say two particles, and it's um, it's a correlation that is um, stronger than you would expect it. To be if quantum mechanics wasn't true, um, mm-hmm. so I, I think um, that's uh, that's kind of how it pans out. And yeah, and there have been um, a bunch of tests that have been done since, and they've established actually the quantum mechanics predictions um, mm-hmm. hold up uh, really, really well. And um, the, this idea of um, you know, uh, is it a uh, a question of um, uh, like a, a, are these two things um, determined at the outset, and then you're just moving them apart, mm. you know? And right. uh, you know, of course, if you, it, it's like sort of uh, Bertelmann socks is a famous example. So if if you know that a guy always comes to work wearing you know a blue sock and a red sock, and then um, you know that he's wearing a, a you know a, a blue sock on the left foot. Then you automatically know he's going to be wearing a red sock mm-hmm. on the right. And initially, there was people like Einstein were saying, "Well, you know, this is uh, clearly this is what's going on, right? It must be." But no, it it turns out it's far more strange than that. You know, this the state of the two particles yeah. are not determined, and um, and there is yeah, a, it's a it's a strong a, correlation between it's just like that. It's a subtle thing. The idea is your your decision to measure this particle here, like like right now, forces it into a, a definite state. And the laws of physics say that its definite state has to be correlated with a definite state of a particle far, far away. Now, the reason you can't use this to send information is because, as we said, uh, you don't know what state it's going to be. You can't choose what state it's going to be fixed in. Like, you can't say, well, we'll tell the people over there that if it shows up tails as opposed to heads, it means this and, and blah, blah, blah. Because you can't determine that. 
And as we said earlier, according to the standard interpretation, uh, there's no way even in principle of knowing, you know, before a measurement, what, there, what, what, the, what the answer is going to be. Even the universe doesn't know, so to speak. Um, and, and so you can't send information. And yet, look, look, Einstein was a pretty smart guy. I think even you would admit, even though you wouldn't give him the trophy for the 20th century. And even he felt that this was weird enough that, you know, it, it was meaningful enough to say that influence was moving instantaneously so that he thought this would violate his law that nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Right. Uh, and so it's pretty weird. And I'll just leave it at that. But but uh, and and the other thing I'll say is, as you point out, you know, all this stuff is unresolved. I mean, uh, well, a lot of it's unresolved. The 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 possibility of the so-called hidden variable, which Einstein championed, he he said, look, it's not that there is no answer. It's just that we don't know the answer. The answer is somewhere in the universe, right? There's a there's a variable we're not aware of that would allow us to predict these uh, states in principle. There's a version of that, I guess, that's still alive, and yet the David Bohm thing, and yet permits yeah. the spooky action at a distance, non-locality, right? Yeah, and Einstein didn't like Bohmian uh, mechanics at all, so he, he, was, he wasn't really satisfied by that. Um, even so, yeah, I think, you know, Einstein was rightly bothered by, you know, the, this realism and causality, and, you know, what you would expect a physical theory, and most of them had, on, uh, you know, up until that point, to tell, be telling you something about about the nature of the world, right? Whereas um, uh, others, you know, the shut up and calculate crowd, as they're often called, you know, that you could argue that actually what we have is a really, really good mathematical description of what's going on. Um, now, who cares what it's actually telling us about? You know, are they electrons leaping about, or you know, are they? Are they waves or, or whatever? You know, who cares? It looks like they're both. Um, let's move on because we have um, a really, you know, well-functioning theory, and um, and you know the loss of sort of causality. Um, uh, you know, you know, is there you know, the wave function pops, and you know we can't go back once we've made that measurement. You know, if we have the results of that measurement, we can't kind of go back and. That, you know, rebuild that that chain of causality, and von Neumann expressly stated that, um, yeah, uh, you know, as far as he could see, you were sort of losing this traditional view of causality, but um, he didn't see that as any reason to abandon quantum mechanics when it, it was such a brilliantly descriptive uh, mm -hmm. theory. So, you know, whilst Einstein was troubled by it, I think uh, von Neumann was was less so. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, in, in a way, you know, we, we still, it's, we still don't really know. And yet quantum mechanics, you know, all these, all these many years later, 100 years later, it's still doing just fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, so, oh yeah, I mean they're making uh, computers based on its principles, as you said. Yeah, and those and those I gather. Well, we should we <laughs> there. I could go on all day about this stuff, but uh, but you're right, it works. Uh, and 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 there are there is the shut up and calculate school of uh, of Copenhagen saying quit worrying about what it means. But um, so anyway, von Neumann, it's pretty clear. Uh, I, I hope we've established that. He understood physics well enough that it's not surprising that he was recruited to work on the Manhattan Project uh, by Robert Oppenheimer, um, who was running uh, the Los Alamos lab. Uh, specifically, they were having trouble. There are these two bomb designs um, and the is it fat boy or fat man bomb, the one that uh, uh, where I guess it uses plutonium and they kind of. Uh, compress it or something until until it blows up uh, he he came in and kind of almost saved that they were having fundamental problems with that and he he kind of saved the day or something yeah so i'll i'll fill in a little bit more um of of what's been happening before uh he he arrives at um the manhattan project um so yeah so he does this work in in Göttingen and moves on and he's he's looking for a job and um, uh, the German universities are 
very happy to give him a professorship. He ends up becoming um, a, one of the youngest, I think, uh, young professors at um, at the University of Berlin, and I think he's at um, Heidelberg, if I remember rightly. And he gets poached, and he gets poached by Princeton. And um, then um, there's this great new institute that's being set up with um, cash from a philanthropic uh, donor, again, some Jewish Americans who have sold up um, what became, uh, if I remember. It right, was Bamberger's it. department store. Yeah, uh, that's right. They sold it to, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm local. I know these things. I've been there. I've been, to, I've been in a Bamberger's anyway. They sold it to Macy's. It was the yeah. Bamberger's, and uh, but the name remained on the stores. And the Bamberger's gave the money to start the Institute for Advanced Study, which is yeah. right next to Princeton University, yeah. although not uh, technically affiliated. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it's a bit uh, confusing because in, during the first year when the buildings weren't complete, um, the, the new staff were, in fact, housed at Princeton, which is where some of the confusion mm -hmm. arises. And... Um, so von Neumann's recruited to that, and they have massive salaries, and he's one of the first five. So there's Einstein, I think, uh, there's von Neumann, and I'm trying to remember whether Gödel was among some of the, uh, the first half as well. Now, von Neumann, um, uh, when... Uh, no, I, I don't think Gödel, Gödel came along later, because von Neumann was instrumental in, in getting Gödel to America, so that must have been later. Um, but he's there, I think, uh, 19... 30. So he's in America. And then Germany, which was sort of von Neumann's intellectual kind of haven, really. I mean, um, both man, you know, it was the center of mathematics. Um, scientifically, you know, Germany was uh, pretty much the center of the world as well. I mean, mathematically, and in, in many cases for, for science and stuff going on in, in England as well. But um, Certainly, Germany was very important, and then um, he watches the Nazis come in, and uh, you know they completely destroy this kind of intellectual paradise, and then they do a lot worse, of course, to to other Jews. And you know, he's here's a, a guy that's also lived through uh, a mini communist uprising, communist revolution, dictatorship um, in Hungary, and that was pretty unpleasant. As was the counter revolution that came afterwards where Jews were kind of also hung and slaughtered in the street as well. So he has developed this, uh, he goes from being this kind of quite cheerful, optimistic um, sort of person to being uh, still superficially um, optimistic and, and cheerful and jolly and, and jokey, but having a really kind of deep cynicism about human nature and a deep worry that we're on the path to uh, extinction. We're, we're going to extinguish ourselves. Um, so this is all developing. And then in 1943, um, oh, and, and he arrives, he knows, he's, he, he knows for a very long time that there's going to be a devastating Second World War. And he's predicting this in letters. And he also predicts that um, uh, Jews will not fare well during this war, that um, there will be um, uh, something terrible will happen to European Jews. And um, so by the time he comes to the States, you know, he's determined to help the US uh, militarily or in any way he, he feasibly um, can. And he, he starts to look at... Um, the mathematics of explosions as, as part of this. And he quickly becomes an expert in the rather um, difficult maths of explosions, like nonlinear non maths. Um, and he, he, he starts to explore that. And um, he's soon cons consulting for the army. And when Oppenheimer writes to him, he is in fact in Britain, on, in wartime Britain, uh, on a tom top secret mission for the uh, Royal Navy. And uh, one of the things he does is help them figure out where German subs uh, are laying mines. And he, he works out, um, you know, the sort of pattern that the Germans are using to lay mines. So he's, he saves quite a few ships um, 
uh, as a as a result of that. And so, yeah, and Oppenheimer writes to him without disclosing what it's what this is all about, and says we're in desperate need um, of your help. And so he comes back to the states, um, goes to Los Alamos, and the problem is, so you have um, yeah, as you say, you've got two different approaches to making an explosion, and they're still you know working on uranium to begin with and the simple model is just you get two bits of uranium and you uh, push them together really quickly that's the, the gun type model and that's well underway but um there was another and idea. that became the nagas and that became the nagasaki bomb um i gosh. think i think I think they yes. used both. It was the first, the first one. Yeah, they used both. One well, well one. von Neumann's was the first. Wasn't von, was von Neumann's the first one? Hiroshima or uh, no? I think uh, I think uh, Fat Man, it was Fat okay. Man. So that was the second, I think. But <laughs> um, von Neumann's uh, was the second. Well, anyway, people can people, people can uh, yeah people could yeah people, people can look that up. But the more powerful bomb was the implosion bomb. So. But that's von um, Neumann's. The, the, and yes, the and, but um, it was it was sort of being developed when he turned up, but nobody really thought it would work apart from I think uh, it was Seth Nadermeyer who thought of this approach. But Nadermeyer was approaching it all wrong. The experiments he was doing, he was doing he, what he was doing was uh, wrapping um, bit, uh, you know, sort of metal tubes with dynamite and then making them go bang to see, um, you know, whether they could sort of crush this uh, tube evenly and so on. It was, all a, it was all a complete mess. And what von Neumann realized pretty quickly is that, um, uh, because he was an ex expert on explosives, is what you needed to do is get a ball of your um, uranium and um, uh, arrange um, shaped charges around it in a sort of sphere, like a modern soccer ball so you know like a geodesic uh, sort of uh, dome like a buckminster fullerene mm -hmm. type thing with hexagons and pentagons and stuff and he, he figured that out really quickly um and that what that does is if you trigger all the explosives at the same time you create this spherical wave front that crushes the um the thing at the center evenly from all sides and if you couldn't do that, then your explosion would fizzle. You wouldn't get you wouldn't get an explosion. Now this turned out to be really really important because um, uranium was um, in short supply, but plutonium, which they were in the midst of refining, was was more reactive, and it wouldn't work. Um, a plutonium bomb that used the gun type model just wouldn't work because the plutonium would just sort of melt before. Um, it collided together. You'd never get the critical mass you needed, and so they mm -hmm. needed an implosion bomb if they were going to make uh, make it work. And as we know, uh, both the, the U.S. military and the government were not, never going to be content with having spent that much money on uh, the bomb project and just come away with one bomb. What they wanted is an assembly line of, of powerful bombs, and the implosion bomb um, was um, kind of the key to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, yeah, so he makes this decisive contribution and uh, once again sort of proves his worth to the American government um, doing it. And, uh, you know, at, at, at that point, um, he moves on to his work with computers. And yeah, can I... Uh, and computers all come together. Can I stop you there? The, the, uh, now, Oppenheimer is said to have had waves of remorse uh, after the bombs were actually used. I mean, for one thing, a lot of the people working on the bomb were surprised. I mean, they went into the project thinking Germany would be the target. And Germany, for a lot of these people, was, you know, enemy number one. Uh, and then they were, then it turned out they were used on, on uh, the bombs were used on Japan. For whatever reason, Oppenheimer, uh, I, I think he reportedly went into uh, President Truman and said, I have blood on my hands. And, and also reportedly Truman, after he left, said, get that crybaby out of there. So I guess Truman wasn't filled with remorse. But did uh, did von Neumann, so far as you're aware, ever have seem to have trouble wrestling with the moral implications of that? Yeah, I think that that, that clash between Truman and Oppenheimer is so interesting. You know, and I've read the the Oppenheimer biography um, as well. That's uh, 
uh, that I'm looking forward to the film. But um, I think Truman was was kind of really angry with Oppenheimer because like if anybody's got blood on my hands, you know, blood on our hands, it's me, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Don't, that let's don't bring that subject up. Basically, yeah. is Truman's. Position, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, you know, you're, 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 you're Truman's telling Oppenheimer you're full of it. You're basically a functionary now. Get yeah. out of my sight. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, von Neumann's approach was that um, he'd come to a democracy, you know, the foremost democracy in the world, and he was going to put himself at the service of that democracy. And he saw what was going on in the Soviet Union. He saw what was going on in Nazi Germany, um, and um, in a way, um, he thought the best that he could do was allow politicians to make those sorts of decisions and and sort of um, put his brain really in in their hands. So, I think that was uh, partly his his um, approach to it. Now, um, in terms of remorse, um, I don't think he ever expressed kind of remorse to his daughter, and. Uh, but we know that he had these troubled dreams that he he woke up one night and he felt he was you know he, he said we are creating a monster and it will make scientists the you know the most feared but the most kind of desired people on the planet so i think you know deep down he was very much aware of what was happening um but you know he felt also that you couldn't stop technological progress that once the genie was out the bottle um, you know, either the Americans would 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 have it, or the Soviet Union would have it, right. or you know, who knows? He, uh, Heisenberg turned out not to be so great at, at making bombs, but um, you know, or the, or the Nazis would have it, and um, he he wanted to make sure that um, you know the U.S. as as a kind of uh, liberal democracy had access to these weapons, um, yeah. and so I think that really shaped his viewpoint he was terrified of um of, of the soviet union um he, yeah he which is that um as as soon as as soon as the soviets had the had the bomb there would be and if they got ahead they would have a strong temptation to to use it on the u.s yeah. and, and and in fact well go ahead yeah and so that leads to how you opened um uh the po podcast really so this idea of um, a preemptive strike on the Soviet Union comes up. And we find for um, a few years, um, I'm not certain how many, after the Second World War, for, uh, for, the, for a few years, the US had a lead over the Soviet Union in producing the bomb. And now that lead quickly disappeared because the Soviet Union had obviously been leaked all of the information anyway, was determined to develop the bomb. And then, you know, in, in some ways, they actually jumped ahead, of course, with the hydrogen bomb. Now, uh, for that period of time, um, the question was in the air, should the US, um, uh, you know, either threaten the Soviet Union with a strike um, unless they gave up any ambitions of developing nuclear weapons or not? And von Neumann was very much of the mind that that's what should happen. But I think what people forget is that the world had just been through um, an extraordinarily devastating war. Um, von Neumann had no trust really left in kind of human nature that he would feel comfortable that there wouldn't be another one and a far more devastating one. In fact, he was absolutely convinced that there would be a third world war with um, nukes and it would be sooner rather than later. And he wasn't alone, right? So Bertrand Russell, the, you know, the famous pacifist, um, he was also he also made this argument. He said we should um, give the Soviets an ultimatum, and the 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 kind of threat that will you know make it known that we're sort of serious is that if they don't give up their nuclear ambitions and um, and we don't put this technology into the hands of some sort of world government, which would, you know, in effect, it would be you know, mm -hmm. America in charge, um, then, you know, we have to, we have to drop the bomb on them. And. But I would, but I would, let me, uh, Russell is, wants to threaten use and presumably follow through on the threat. Sometimes von Neumann speaks as if he just wants to bomb them. Right. I mean, he, he, 
it's not you don't even stop to threaten them. But but it, was it in fact his position that of course you would threaten them first? Um, it is not clear. That that's yeah. not clear. And um, what is clear is that uh, as soon as the Soviets developed any kind of retaliatory strike capability, he changed his mind. Um, he was pretty serious about a preemptive strike uh, for uh, several years. Um, the finer points of whether they should be offered an ultimatum first, I I don't know. I mean, he's famous for saying, if you say, you know, bomb them to, tomorrow, I say, why not today? If you say four o'clock, why, you know, why not one o'clock? And I have heard you know, different people have differing accounts of what he meant by this. Was mm -hmm. he making some sort of, you know, game theoretic point? No, his daughter doesn't think so. His daughter thinks he was uh pretty serious uh, about this but i've heard it argued that um you know what he was saying was that in theory if you're going to say you know the soviet union should be prevented from uh from from building these bombs then what's stopping you right and and the earlier the better uh -huh. but um uh, later on um he changed his mind and the only um uh the only actual documents and his serious vision of nuclear strategy that we know of, or at least that I know of, um, that was uh, out there, he makes a, a different case, which is um, holding kind of nuclear weapons in reserve, sort of should um, nuclear weapons come to be used, they should be used in a sort of tit for tat way. And mm -hmm. later on, we see that strategy being developed at RAND. And RAND was hugely influenced uh, by von Neumann's game theory, and von Neumann was a consultant there. Now, at the same time, there isn't a lot of evidence that actually von Neumann was deeply embedded in nu nuclear strategy, and he certainly didn't think, the didn't think much of the prisoner's dilemma, right? Yep. Um, which, let, me, let, me, let me drill down on that point. That's interesting. So the prisoner's dilemma is an example of a non-zero-sum game where through cooperation, two people can both when, uh, you know, there's a possibility of a, of a win-win outcome, possibility of a lose-lose outcome, possibility of a lose-win outcome, it varies. But the point is, it, there, the two uh, fortunes are not necessarily inversely correlated. It's not like, uh, you know, for one to win, the other has to lose. That would be a zero-sum game. When I, so, so von Neumann uh, starts game theory and writes uh, in, in collaboration with Oscar Morgenstern, the, the first fundamental text, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, in 1944, a big book, which I certainly haven't read, but I've looked through it. And I remember when I looked through it, I was surprised that there's almost nothing about non-zero-sum games. I mean, they coined the term, but the book is almost entirely about zero-sum games. And at the time, I wondered... Uh, well, does that explain uh, why von Neumann comes off as so kind of warlike sometimes? Because like he sees this thing between the U.S. and the Soviet Union as win-lose. Somebody's uh, got to lose. When in fact, of course, nuclear war is a classic non-zero-sum game. There is a lose-lose outcome. That means it's non-zero-sum. Relatively speaking, there's a win-win outcome, which is not to have the war. But, but um, I, I assume that uh, that's a facile idea uh but 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 the way i wanted to approach it uh with you is to ask do you think it was kind of a and there may be no answer but do you think it was just kind of inevitable that the first phase of the development of game theory would be in a zero-sum kind of framework that's just a natural way to start thinking about these things i mean uh and and inevitably it was going to it was going to take a while for people to come up with the prisoner's dilemma and really get into depth about non-zero-sum games. Or is it possible that, in fact, von Neumann's dwelling on the zero-sum did say something about his worldview? Right. So this is incredibly interesting, at least for me. So uh, part of part of um, part of this that we, we we sort of haven't explained is that von Neumann made kind of the first definitive contribution to game theory in his um, early 20s with the Minimax theorem. And what he showed with that was um, that all two-player non-zero-sum games, right, have a solution. Now, Wait, all, all two-player non-zero-sum or zero-sum? 
sorry, zero sum. Oh, my goodness. Right. Uh, so two, uh, yeah, two player zero sum games. All two player zero sum games have a solution. So like noughts and crosses, right? Somebody's got to, you know, somebody's got to win or whatever. Um, let me, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering if I gave the right example there and I potentially didn't, but um Anyway, we should um, say in your defense that the paperback is coming out right about the time this lands, which means the book came out a year ago, which means you finished half. researching it a year before that. <laughs> and so uh, you, and you haven't been on the publicity circuit for a year. So you can be a few, uh, 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 excused if, if, if uh, some of the details are fuzzy. But go yeah. ahead. So but he, he came up with this in his early 20s. So this was back in the 1920s. And this was the first kind of um, thing that established game theory as a field. And it was for zero-sum games, two-player zero-sum games. And um, yeah, if we, um, right, yeah, it, it, like there's there's one game that I know is uh, a two-player zero-sum game is is Matching Pennies, which is this example that he gives um, quite early on. So two two players have a coin, and if they match. One player gets to keep it, and if they if they're different, then the other player gets to keep it. Now, what's a good strategy for that? Well, um, it is clearly not to keep playing heads, and it's clearly not to keep playing tails. So, uh, what the best strategy is is a mixed strategy. So you randomize, and we all know that, right? But uh, von Neumann showed that for all such two-player zero-sum games there was a solution in the form of either you know, a pure strategy, which is you pick one or the other, or a mixed strategy, this, this randomization. But then he sort of totally, so having birthed the field at that point, he totally leaves it alone for over 10 years. He doesn't do anything. Nobody else really gets anywhere. And that, why, why did he do that? Why was he able to do that? Well, I think the reason that he tackled zero-sum games at that point is because Mathematically, they are so much easier to <laughs> deal with okay. than non-zero sum games. You can, you know, get rid of so many extraneous, uh, extraneous things, and you can drill down. He, you know, he was a mathematician. He wanted to prove a theorem, a theorem that had, you know, escaped other brilliant mathematicians. He was in his early twenties. So there, there's already one factor, right? So to what degree did the fact that the math was easy then go and inspire? Um, the way that game theory initially mm-hmm. um, initially got off to. So the second factor here is that game theory, people were thinking about, mathematicians were thinking about games and strategy from about the turn of the um, uh, 20th century. Uh, so, for, yeah, from about the turn of the 20th century in the in mid-1900s, uh, mid-1800s to late 1800s. And at the time, um, Maths was um, kind of producing brilliant results. There was a lot of optimism in the air. So you had mathematicians and um, thinking, well, why don't we apply maths to warfare, to diplomacy, to all of these fields, and maybe we can help forge world peace? So, you know, it it depends how far back you you go go back. You could argue that, Mm -hmm. in fact... Game theory was the product of minds, of somewhat naive mathematical minds who wanted to help, who wanted to forge sort of world peace. Mm-hmm. Now, von Neumann comes along, he, he, he produces the minimax theory, leaves it alone. He meets Morgenstern in Princeton and really as a hobby, whilst he's helping, you know, he's working on computers by this stage and he's, he's working on the bomb and uh, various simulations and stuff, he comes up with game theory. Now, um, theory of games and economic behavior is uh, pretty. It's a, it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty difficult book, and it's um, it's quite fun in the sense that the only real theorem that von Neumann has to play with is his minimax theorem. So everything begins with with minimax and his his zero sum games. But he knows because Morgenstern told him, and because he, he's you know, he knows well enough because he's already done some important work in economics um, on, on dynamic e- equilibrium, on the way economies grow and, and shrink and stuff. He knows that um, non-zero-sum games um, are, are 
are the you know are the most important right. ones to explore. And he's desperate to say something about them, but he's stuck with two player zero sum games. So what he does through theory of games of economic behavior is sort of try to bootstrap his way up to multiplayer non zero sum games. And um, his approach to doing this is um, is rather it's rather odd, and it it turns out to be rather unwieldy. And we need uh, John Forbes Nash really to come along and um, and help us later on to to actually um, start uh, another another Princeton guy. Yes, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and they they of course knew each other, although I'm not sure how much they liked each other. Um, so. And well, Nash was during, a di famously difficult character, I would say, in, in Von yes. Orion's defense. Yeah. Yeah. So theory of games and economic behavior, the way Von Neumann bootstraps his way up is by thinking about um, uh, three-player games where two players, for example, cooperate with each other and leave the other player out. So then you can model that as a two-player zero-sum game, and you can do that with Say a five player, a game, two player, yeah, a, a two, two player non, a two player non zero sum game. Uh, so initially, you can model that as a um, uh, a two player zero sum game. You have say one okay. coalition of three, another coalition of two, and they're playing this zero sum game. Now, um, so that is how he deals with multiplayer games. But then to bootstrap his way up to um, non zero sum games, he basically creates this sort of banker who looks after the kind of utility. So he creates this um, kind of dummy player, which allows him to kind of then um, uh, treat, um, uh, you know, the these uh, uh, non-zero-sum games as zero-sum games. So the, this sort of banker-type invention holds on to the extra utility. And this, this is like a really unwieldy way of looking at it. But what's interesting is that von Neumann puts cooperation um, front and center all the way through theory of games and economic behavior. Now, it's a funny kind of cooperation because um, it's... Because uh, it's, it's in the service of a larger zero-sum game? Is that it? I mean... Yeah, it's... it's Yeah, it's that's right. I it's mean, sort of, you know, if you look, it's like doubles tennis is a good way to describe the difference between zero-sum and non-zero-sum. The, 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 the two teams of two are playing a zero-sum game. But on, on, on one side of the net, it's totally non-zero-sum. They are partners. Either they're go, both going to win or both going to lose. So whenever you have coalitions playing a zero-sum game against each other, there is non-zero-sumness within the coalition. So that's, it's in that sense you mean that uh, the logic of cooperation is prominent in the book? Yeah. Um, so it, it's about – so it, the whole thing is about finding equilibrium solutions to these, to these um, multiplayer games. So if there's a seven mm – -hmm play a game are there any stable coalitions between five of the players and two of the players right um so you've got two to two coalitions and so you can treat that mathematically now as a two-player game and then if you create this sort of banker type characters holding the extra utility for them it, you, you can also treat that as a zero-sum game it's highly artificial and um it doesn't really work brilliantly yeah. well but then it would inspire you know, um, later mathematicians later to actually get involved with the nitty gritty of treating um, kind of non zero sum games and multiplayer games uh, more usefully. But mm. I think it's so, I mean, interesting. Even there, it, I mean, well, go ahead. It's interesting that um... Um, that von Neumann, who's later seen, and in fact, Kubrick takes, of course, inspiration from him and a few other people like uh, Teller. Um, to forge his Dr. Strangelove, right? Because von Neumann's the one that turns up to um, Atomic Energy Commission meetings in a wheelchair. So he's really one of these important uh, models for, for Strangelove. But von Neumann really objected to Nash's um, approach to, um, to game theory because, you know, initially Nash was talking about non-communication and um, you know, kind of uh, an almost a, a much more dog eat dog sort of uh, approach really to game theory. And von Neumann um, was convinced that this sort of cooperation, uh, kind of for mutual benefit, was 
what humans would do. Uh, whereas Nash always said he had a much more American conception of game theory. And I think that's really, at least psychologically in the early days, I think that's sort of what mm-hmm. triumphed and what was um, circulating through through Rand and so, so that so that suggests that my my conjecture is wrong uh, that it wasn't in von Neumann's nature not to think about cooperative possibilities which are inherently non-zero sum, um, and in fact he was inclined to. I mean, it sounds like uh, a big difference there is uh, in a non-zero sum game if you can't communicate, you're less likely to wind up with a cooperative solution uh, 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 often. And and Nash wanted to assume non, uh, non-communication, which is interesting. Uh, because in a global context, it, it, it emphasizes the importance of staying of like uh, the leaders of the Soviet Union and the U.S. <laughs> keeping open lines of communication. Um, the uh, um, I, I, I want to now I, I gather you have to go in a few minutes. I don't. But if you but uh, if, if you do, maybe we should ju- we should take a couple of things quickly. One is so. So then there's the whole computer thing where von Neumann. Um, you know, the von Neumann architecture is like, you know, central processing unit, memory, and so on. He, he's basically, I guess you could say he's taking Turing's, and he knew Turing. And, you know, it's amazing to think how much talent there was at Princeton at one point. And just, it's like, when you have, you know, the Institute for Advanced Study very, was a very small building in those days. And you had Gerdel and Einstein and von Neumann. And then at some, at various times, you know, Turing and and uh, and so on show up. Uh, but anyway, the... um. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, he, he works out uh, some of his uh, kind of mastery of, of ideas related to computer by working on the ENIAC computer at, that is at Penn at that point. And yeah. uh, a, a, par, a big part of his motivation, it sounds like, is he is is he wants the U.S. to get the hydrogen bomb and, and you need this machine to do uh, the calculations. Right. Is that fair? Yeah, that's um, that's right. I mean, it's not. It's by no means um, his only, or in fact, later, um, or even at the beginning, um, his his main motivation. I mean, he's telling people different things, right? We see that very clearly. So, in his dealings with the military, when he goes on to develop his own computer at the IAS, he's telling the military, "Oh, there's going to be masses of military applications to this," and then he's telling the scientists, "There's going to be." huge numbers of scientific applications and he he reels them off and he gets he gets the military to fund uh, i think more than 50 percent of the ias computer but he also gets them to agree to put the whole thing in the public domain right he mm-hmm. says i firmly believe that this is in the best interest of america and I, that's why i said earlier i see him as a sort of godfather of the open source movement and um and the progress reports that um he put out with uh, goldstein who was uh really the guy that introduced him to the whole uh, eniac project quite by accident on a on a railway pra- platform um uh you know they they co-author these reports and send them out into the world and they uh, essentially birth the first generation of programmable computers and you know the von neumann architecture is the uh, the blueprint for all of those computers and, and computers today and yeah and just um just going back um yeah turing um von neumann wrote yeah turing a reference uh turing wrote to von neumann saying i'm a big fan of your work and turing had as a as a book prize uh, from a maths competition when he was at school turing had asked for a copy of von Neumann's um, mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics for some light reading, you know, for the <laughs> sixteen-year-old or however however old he was then. And of course, uh, Turing could read German, and um, foundations were only published in German for about uh, I think a decade before it was translated into English. Now, it's not that surprising because many um, many scientists, whether they're American or English, could read. Uh, German at the time they had to because uh, you know a lot of the major papers of quantum mechanics a lot of major mass papers they were you know they were all they were all uh, in German so it, it's not uh, that surprising but but Turing um, uh, Turing's first paper was actually developing certain um, mathematical themes in I think uh, von Neumann's fifty third or fifty seventh uh, paper so 
you know, he, uh, Turing was a massive admirer. And as a result of this uh, letter of reference, Turing came over to Princeton um, to do his PhD, not with von Neumann, um, but it was there that he gets his proofs for his um, uncomputable numbers, which is where he developed this idea of the, um, the universal Turing machine, which is mm-hmm. now seen many, many years later as a sort of theoretical prototype of a programmable computer, although that is not really how Turing conceived it. Um, but these ideas were, you know, around von Neumann, and um, he was also uh, clearly inspired by Gödel. He was really um, um, uh, very close to actually getting the incom- Gödel's incompleteness theorems himself, and right. um, he admired Gödel greatly. And the way that Gödel approached his incompleteness theorems was to create a sort of mathematical language um, that he then used to um, uh, examine the the nature of arithmetic and and um, and that mathematical language. Uh, if you examine that now, what you can see is, in some ways, what he was doing was writing the first computer algorithms. Now it, it takes uh, you know a great uh, there's probably you know uh, many benefits of hindsight, but there were certain ways of thinking. There were loops uh, which are used in computer programming that Gödel kind of used there. Um, the, the entire language um, is all written in numbers, but it can reproduce all of kind of first order logic. Um, and von Neumann was completely up to date and he appreciated the importance of all of this work in a way that probably no other mathematician other than, mm-hmm. say, Turing or Gödel really did. And so he arrives on the scene at the ENIAC and he uses this um, th- this uh, sort of awareness of mathematical logic to really distill out um, in logical terms, what do we mean by a programmable computer? And yep, you've got the CPU, the memory unit, um, you've got stuff shuttling back and forth between them and, um, you know, you've got the... Uh, yeah, the, the 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 addition unit to, to to add those binary letters, and he just sets it out in such um, a convincing um, and uh, pure way that it becomes this uh, blueprint for all time. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of how it comes together. I'm actually not in a in a rush to leave. Um, so oh, good. I can stay uh, for, for for longer than you probably want me. So. Well, good, uh, because um, I, I want to say, uh, first of all, I was surprised to find out uh, in your book that Turing, I mean, on the one hand, he certainly understood the importance of computers and what was to come. He, of course, came up with the or the Turing test, more or less, uh, as, a, as a way of thinking about what it would mean to have true artificial intelligence. On the other hand, when he invented the so-called Turing machine, uh, you know, I, I had not realized it was really in the service of just thinking about a fundamental uh, question at the foundations of mathematics. So he said, he said, well, let's do a thought experiment. Suppose you had this thing that could read a tape and it could, you know, and it could put symbols on it and erase it and it could do these various other things. And then he establishes that, well, this thing could really calculate a lot of stuff. You know, that this is and, and that, um, you know, could solve a lot of kinds of problems. And that became the so-called universal machine. Uh, but, but, but the instantiation he described with this tape thing is not the way it, it, it was really realized. And, and von Neumann played a big role. I don't want to act, look, I mean, ENIAC was not the only computer project going on. And so I, I, I don't, I don't, you know, we don't want to, uh, overstate von Neumann's role, but as you say, uh, he was the first to kind of stay, say like, look, generically, if you want to, you know, when we turn this into a real practical thing, you know, look, it's not, you know, it's not going to have this tape that Turing's talking about. I mean, the practical way, it, the the essential ingredients you're going to need are memory, CPU, several other things, input, output, and a fifth thing. Uh, and I guess sketching it out that way was 
was very clarifying for people. Is that the idea? I mean, was this kind of, was this implicit in the computer projects that were going on, but no one had bothered to say, here are the fundamental ingredients in what we're doing or what? No, no. Um, and in fact, I mean, the ideas were, were floating around in, in some form, but um, there weren't, uh, at the, in, the, in the early stages of his involvement, as, as far as von Neumann knew, there were no uh, programmable computers, digital programmable computers anyway around, and there's nothing um, that you could feed with a program and it would, it would do anything. Um, and you had to sort of, it was like a sort of uh, telephone switchboard. You would have to kind of move cables around and stuff. And in fact, um, that, and there's, there was a huge dispute about this between the, the makers of the ENIAC and uh, later on, and, and, and von Neumann and other people about whether he'd actually come up with these ideas himself or whether he just tapped into kind of these ideas that were in the air. But what is true and um, kind of um, there's a great book called The ENIAC in Action, which really lays out von Neumann's contribution and shows how he distilled these ideas into kind of the modern kind of uh, form. Um, uh, the, this was kind of a vital contribution. And then later on, what he did was his own computer, he realized, was not going to be ready for years. The computer project of the IAS was going quite slowly. The, the, so, Institute, for Advanced, the Institute for Advanced Study. Yeah, the Princeton. Institute for Advanced yeah. Study, uh, which he secured all this funding for. But it, it, that would only come line, I think, uh, online in about 1953. But the military... And Los Alamos was putting pressure on, uh, they had huge pressure for um, computing power. They needed computing power. Um, they needed to do these hydrogen bomb simulations. Um, and there was all sorts of other number crunching that they needed to do. So what von Neumann did was um, he came back with people from Los Alamos and the team at the ENIAC. And he and his wife, Clara Dan, helped to rewire the ENIAC into what is essentially the first um, programmable digital computer, okay. right? And you know, again, um, people are going to argue with me about this, and all I'm going to say is read the ENIAC, ENIAC in action, take it up with the author, you know, the historians who put that together. But um, I found their case pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. um, but so there was that's one aspect of his importance for computing. But really, I think... Um, his more, if anything, important role is the fact that when he built his own computer, which was behind schedule, he published um, everything. So circ from circuit diagrams to how do you build this adder to how do you do this to how do you do that? And he just put it out there. And the first computers were essentially a copy of his, and they beat him right. to it. And then IBM's first commercial uh, digital um, electronic uh, computer. You have to put all these caveats in, and I, I sometimes, you know, because I'm not a computer scientist, as you know, or a computer historian, I'll overlook one caveat or another and get myself, land myself in trouble. But ele electronic, programmable, digital, <laughs> etc., computer, the kind that we have today. Um, IBM's first commercial effort is apparently a carbon copy of um, the IAS. The Institute for Advanced Study Machine that von Neumann has has built, and, and that's physically in next. Princeton. That machine was physically yeah. in Princeton. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. it was. well, um, it got. It wasn't in. Yeah, it was at the. Yes, that's right. It was at the IAS. Yes, which is in Princeton. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, so that's that's interesting. That okay. So this pro, it's a there's a kind of this you might call it a priority dispute, but but these. These guys who had been working on ENIAC, you know, when von Neumann came out and described the basic architecture, they said, wait a second, to some extent, you're drawing on ideas that we had something to do with. But their uh, their goal had been to patent their yeah. ideas. And so I guess one can imagine, depending on how the legal stuff had played out, one can imagine a world in which the computer itself, <laughs> right, uh, was uh, something that you, you weren't allowed to build unless you play, paid royalties to somebody. Of course, there are various parts of specific parts of a computer. You, know, you can't use an Intel chip 
without paying royalties. But but you can build a computer, and and you're saying that that to some extent is a legacy of John von Neumann's. The fact that the whole idea of a computer is in the public domain. Yeah, yeah. Eckert and Morsley, who were the creators of the ENIAC, I mean, obviously incredibly clever and talented people themselves. They um, you know, after the war was over, they were very determined to start their own company and wanted to patent um, this stuff. Now, the uh, the first report, uh, the draft report on the EDVAC, which is where von Neumann had set out, you know, what we now call the von Neumann architecture. Now, he had done that as a favor to Goldstein. He was charged by the entire group, including Eckert and Morsley, to sort of draft this report. And then von Neumann sends this report to Goldstein, and Goldstein rather mischief- mischievously uh, gets this typed up, and then he sends it to everybody <laughs> who's interested that he knows of all the way around the world without Eckert and Morchley's permission, without von Neumann's knowledge. So, you know, Eckert and Morchley were furious, and they were furious at von Neumann. They were really furious at Goldstein, but in some ways, you know, von Neumann, um, um, uh, you know, it, you know, he hadn't, you know, deliberately set out to do this. But it is very clear that he is not comfortable with Eckert and Morchley's attempts to patent it, to patent uh, the project. Mm-hmm. And he, there's um, a letter to his lawyer where he says, if I'd have known that, you know, I was working at a, a, you know, a university in Philadelphia, if I'd have known that this was actually a commercial project, I never would have agreed to participate. Um, mm-hmm. So when he heard that they were patenting it, and he then um, started send, sending his lawyer details of you know how he actually has an intellectual claim to this stuff, and they they can't patent it. But by the time these legal disputes were resolved, you know he was long dead. He had no chips left in the game. And uh, what the court would rule after all this time was that the very fact that the Edvac report had been published that negated that, that put stuff in the in the public domain and therefore ex and Morsley, um couldn't patent um uh couldn't patent the computer and the computer was was out there it became kind of um knowledge for for everybody um so yeah yeah he certainly played a, an extremely important role and we know how he really felt because when it came to his um computer project he um you know, those uh, patents were made over to the university and they were, you know, all the project was put in the public domain. Much to the chagrin, it must be added to some of the engineers who were not entirely yeah. <laughs> happy that uh, kind of their intellectual contributions were being given away for free. Is this uh, kind of related to his attitude toward the Soviet Union? And um, what I mean by that is, you know, as we've as we've established, he didn't have warm feelings toward the Soviet regime. <laughs> uh, he wanted to launch a preemptive nuclear strike. Um, but and one could imagine somebody coming out of World War II with a different feeling. If if your animus is quite naturally directed toward Nazi Germany, you might say, "Well, the Soviets were fighting the Nazis, right?" Uh, so I don't, you know, they're they 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 maybe they have their virtues. You might not be so worked up about that. But but clearly von Neumann. Uh, saw the German the problem of, of Nazi Germany as part of a larger problem about repressive authoritarian rule, right? Yeah. And, and 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 was a liberal in the kind of classic sense. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, I, I don't know that you get into this book. Would, would you call him kind of a libertarian? Because you know the open source movement in computers is. The, you know, often these people are libertarians. The, the most ardent advocates of, of open source often are uh, libertarians. So, I mean, is his support for open source, uh, he's one of the founding open source, he's maybe the founding open source person, uh, the found, you know, the founding figure. Is that kind of, of a piece with his uh, uh, nearly maniacal opposition to the Soviet Union? Um, does that make sense? Well, yeah, yes. Yeah. So this is uh, there's another. It's a really interesting question. So yeah, he had terrible experiences of totalitarianism. So it wasn't just you know the Nazis where he saw friends perish. He was very active in in getting um, 
intellect, Jewish intellectuals over to, to the States. Um, he was, um, um, you know, and, and intellectually, you know, he, he was not, um, and this, uh, I'm saying this at the time, he was um, at a time when Princeton itself was racist and it was anti-Semitic. And he was neither of those, well, he wasn't anti-Semitic, obviously, but he was also not racist. I mean, there's, um, it was brought to my attention after the book was published, how he had actually um, supported um, kind of um, kind of leading uh, leading black mathematician. He'd he'd worked obviously with uh, some of the leading a couple of the leading Indian physicists at the time, and he didn't really you know he he saw objections over somebody's skin color to be ludicrous, and this made him quite different in the yeah. milieu that he was in. Um, so we also you know if we're kind of building this guy up to be some sort of Dr. Strangelove, we also have to kind of um, take into account, you know, the other parts, the other aspects of his personality, that he was, um, if not a libertarian, um, he, he was somebody who just, you know, he's too rational, really, to take any of this stuff seriously. Mm-hmm. He couldn't imagine that, you know, you would, um, you know, not work with somebody or encourage somebody's work because they happen to have a different skin color to the one that, that you mm-hmm. have. But um, I think um, this openness, um, it, it's also related to why he so could not abide Nash's solution as well to game theory. And I think that goes back to the kind of Hungarian Budapest, the, the Middle Europa, this Central European um, way that academia works. And he loved this. And, and, and the way that worked was, you know, as a mathematician, as a scientist, you would be giving talks, you would be going to cafes and bars and discussing your ideas. You know, there was a free flow, an exchange of ideas. Mm-hmm. And um, when von Neumann came over to the States, he was actually stung quite badly when um, um, an American, a, a more senior American mathematician, uh, built on one of his ideas. And he asked uh, the mathematician, whose name sadly escapes me right now, is the ergodic, the, 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 the theory is the ergodic um, theorem. And von Neumann had a proof of this, but he hadn't published it. Um, and he was in the, in the process of sort of sending it off. And he asked this guy to, you know, pause and let's publish together. He said, you know, no. Um, and so, and now the, ergo, the ergodic theorem was known um uh under under his name even though von neumann had made some crucial inroads oh. into it that um that were that were used in the in the latter theorem so he was affronted by this and he was not like that as a mathematician and scientist he was he was all about working with other people crediting other people and but he also yeah. wanted to be credited himself um, right. And uh, when people claimed stuff that he'd done for themselves, he was furious. So he certainly had an ego as far as that went. But he was um, this believer in kind of openness because that was the most productive environment that he had known. And it was for him the most kind of enjoyable um, mm-hmm. period of his life. So I think that really um left a mark that sort of upbringing up until you know 1930 or so and he was absolutely well, you know, he was devastated by what happened to european I, I don't think he ever went back um after what the nazis had done yeah the uh this kind of ethos of openness and collaboration uh was uh, pretty pervasive in early computer culture i would say in silicon valley i mean silicon valley has gotten uh, more mercenary maybe but uh the hacker ethos uh, whether whether by coincidence or for, or for whatever explanation, I, I I think kind of reflects von Neumann's worldview. Um, he uh, b- before I, uh, we should just quickly we should mention that uh, his wife was one of the first computer programmers, and I think the first person ever to write a subroutine. Possibly right. The subroutine is a fundamental part of computer programming, but she worked on the coding. Uh, in the ENIAC phase, uh, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, so von Neumann, Goldstein, they were busily developing 
you know, all of the um, staples really of, of modern programming at this time, right? The flow chart and all of this, they, they, they were, they were producing this stuff and putting it out there. And Clara Dan, who is von Neumann's second wife, also a Hungarian, also from a, a wealthy family, also Jewish. His first wife um, w- was similar and she, she left him because um, she felt neglected because he was so busy thinking and, um, and writing mathematical papers. And then in between, they would have these grand parties where he would uh, get merrily drunk and then disappear off to, to write some theorem or, or something else. And um, she felt sort of neglected and she ended up leaving him for um, uh, a, a, a much younger, I think, um, scientist who was uh, not as busy consulting for the, the Navy, the, uh, the, the, the Army and so on. So Clara Dan was um, his, his second wife and they have these incredible love letters that they uh, sent to each other um, for a while, which is, um, exposes another not well-known aspect of von Neumann's personality. Now she, I think, had no schooling beyond um, kind of 18, she didn't go to university and she considered herself a mathematical kind of dunce. And, you know, she, she called herself uh, so. Now she's clearly being modest. She was extremely intelligent. And she, we know that she is responsible for, for what is now regarded as the first modern computer program ever to run on a computer. And um, uh, yeah, and when in that we see um, a particular kind of loop um, that um, other computer scientists are you know, credited with inventing several years later, but it's all there in Clara von Neumann's hand. And um, while the Manchester baby is often cited as the first kind of publicly at least known a programmable computer, um, it turns out that her program, which was an atom bomb simulation showing how neutrons bounced around inside, um, uh, I think, uranium inside an atom bomb, um, uh, that was um, run on the, on the rewired ENIAC in this, um, uh, in this form, uh, which made it a sort of programmable computer, a sort of um, prototype of a programmable computer. That ran, um, I think, a, a couple of months earlier or several weeks earlier than the famous program on the Manchester Baby. Now, if you compare them, the Manchester, all the Manchester Baby did was, you know, uh, it was a few lines of code that, um, uh, that uh, calculated uh, the factor of a very large number and Clara Dan's program, it was actually a working um, simulation of a atom bomb, of a nuclear weapon. Um, those are quite different things and um, quite different levels of complexity. And moreover, um, whether or not Clara Dan's program ran a few weeks earlier or later, I mean, it's a, it's a whole different level of achievement. And really, it's, it's Dan's program that you can um, see is the kind of the first proper modern computer program it's got it's got everything you would expect a modern computer mm-hmm. program to have um yeah. right there and um i think she wrote it in machine code as well so <laughs> and so on this issue of his his parties he he was an interesting uh, interesting guy i mean on the one hand he seems to have had some of the things we kind of stereotypically associate with this kind of genius, which is that maybe in some respects he didn't understand uh, other people so well or interact with them in normal ways. I mean, his daughter, who later became the the first uh, the first female uh, member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors uh, in the United States, an economist, um, said that he had this weird arrangement. She was a daughter of his first marriage. Uh, where he he wanted where his wife would get custody for the first twelve years or something, and then once she reached the age of reason, he wanted custody so that he could then uh, turn her into a genius. And I guess somebody did pretty well with her upbringing. Um, but 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 he's 
she said he didn't understand like once you read once you're an adolescent you know when you when age 13 is like you're not really interested in becoming a genius you know <laughs> you're, you're interested in a lot of other things maybe that's uh not that representative but in any event he uh he he had this side that was the wild partying side he liked to drive fast cars he got in car crashes he uh he had these parties very sociable gregarious guy in a way that uh, some geniuses aren't right. Uh, I mean, did he also have the side that his daughter suggests of kind of not, uh, get it, you know, reading the room or, um, or, or what, how, how would you characterize? Yeah. Him I, mean, I mean, she, she was never really sure which, um, you know, which was the true von Neumann, if you like, was it this, you know, quite cynical, um, somewhat detached figure or was it this gregarious one she thought kind of both were true aspects of his personality and i think that's the conclusion that i would reach um well you know there was you know he, he memorized rude limericks i mean in some way you could imagine these to be kind of coping mechanisms right as well i mean you've got this person who's unimaginably smart you know the Certainly, the smartest, if we define smart as just sheer brain processing power, that's probably the smartest person we know of in the 20th century. Um, and yet, he is able to write these quite passionate love letters. Um, you know, he has two pretty normal relationships, as, as far as you can make out. Um, his daughter loved him to the end. He was not estranged from his daughter. He didn't behave strangely. I mean, his daughter is. Uh, has done probably more to keep his legacy alive than than anyone else. So um, in many ways, he's he's a very human figure, and you don't um, see that in quite a few mathematicians of his um, of his stature, right? And I think that goes back again partly to his upbringing, where he had this very social upbringing where you know being in the world was um was important but did he truly understand people i you know i i read that he found it difficult to connect with women right i mean uh, his best friend stan ulam um said that but then i found that really difficult to square with um the accounts written um uh, by the women themselves, by like Stan Ulam's wife, who thought he was he was he was great and lovable, and says very many nice things about him. And clearly, um, she found him to be um, uh, you know uh, this gregarious and charming figure. So I really didn't know what to um, to make of that. I I could only conclude that um, if he disguised his awkwardness he he did it well and i think you also have to take into account that there was a great deal of envy you know um uh around him you know no matter how nice he would try to be he became very wealthy himself he was always in demand um he could almost effortlessly churn out theorems i mean that that's going to you know that People want to be able to say something negative about him to make themselves feel better. And I've even perhaps his, his best friend. And um, I'm sure, you know, he could be awkward and, and all of those things. And I think um, there were telltale signs when I read some of the, uh, some of what Clara Dan said about him. For example, he had to flip a switch. Um, a certain number of times before he's happy, or a drawer would have to be open and closed. Um, uh, so he had he had obsessive times. compulsive disorder. Yeah, I, I think he. You know, I, I guess they didn't. So like like a light that. switch, like a light yeah. switch, he would have to switch to turn on and off seven times or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, that speaks to me of uh, you know uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Although I had not. Um, seen that mentioned in the in the uh, the kind of straight biography uh, that was written of him uh, three decades ago by Norman McRae, um, but mm -hmm. I noticed it in in her writings um, that were that were published. 
Um, so, you know, that would be the conclusion that I would reach. So certainly he had kind of these behaviors and, and this awkwardness. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, I'm, I was just bowled over that he was, you know, socially functional, uh, highly, you know, pretty socially <laughs> functional in the way that he was at all, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I kind of agree. I mean, he, he uh, because we really, uh, you know, we've left some things out. I mean, in terms of if you, if you want to list his array of accomplishments, I mean, he was, you know, I had said that uh, Hilbert was maybe the only person other than Einstein who was closing in on relativity. Uh, you know, von Neumann wasn't that far. I mean, if you, if you, uh, and I guess we, we, we maybe alluded to this, but, uh, if you list the people who were kind of might've wound up, uh, doing the, uh, incompleteness theorem that Gerdel is famous for, you know, von Neumann, when he first heard Gerdel speak, he, before Gerdel had published, he, he appreciated something that others didn't who were in the room and started corresponding with Gerdel and, uh, and was and got some things and then very graciously backed off when Gerdel said, yeah, I'm about to publish that or something. But, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. he was just, uh, he, he had an amazing intellect. Uh, I guess it's safe to say. Um, yeah. And on that, on the Gerdel, uh, so he, um, said, um, he was basically on the way to proving the second incompleteness theorem. And he'd written to Gödel, and as you say, Gödel said, basically, back off, I'm going to publish this. But um, mm -hmm. I've been informed that there's some more recent work, like in the last few years, that shows actually Gödel was kind of bluffing. Um, that he was thinking about it, mm. but he wasn't as close to the second incompleteness theorem as von Neumann was. So um, I'm really? going to have to delve, yeah, I'm going to have to delve into this um, myself, but there's some nice published historical work that that looks at where Gödel really was and I think you know um you know maybe we could be calling it the von Neumann Gödel incompleteness theorem <laughs> um, well that would seal that that would pretty much seal your case that uh you know Einstein should be relegated to the margins of intellectual history <laughs> no that's of course not what you're saying but um that would uh that would be a uh feather in his cap let's say in 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 uh von Neumann's cap the and just by the way, I mean, in in terms of how impressed we should be that von Neumann could function at all socially, in terms of being it, it, when he's that smart. I mean, look at Gerdel, you know, genius, but uh, you know, borderline mentally ill. I mean, he he uh, you know he he wound up uh, starving to death because he was paranoid about his uh, food being poisoned, um, and uh, and his wife so, had gone away. His wife who. Mm -hmm. basically looked after him. She'd, she'd left to make a family visit, I think, or a, a visit for a couple of weeks, a few weeks. And uh, yes, yeah, she came back to find him emaciated because he had become paranoid about that his food was contaminated and she rushed into hospital, but it was, uh, it was too late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So last, I guess the last question is just about, uh, it gets back to computers, the von Neumann architecture, you know, the von Neumann machine is, is a so-called serial processor. It, it, it does kind of one thing at a time that's contrasted with parallel processing, which does lots of things at, at a time. And, you know, like, uh, obviously the brain does a lot of parallel processing. It's, it seems to be unconscious because our conscious minds are serial. We can only think about normal people at least can only kind of think about one thing at a time in a, in a certain sense, but there's a lot of, uh, processing, parallel processing going on. And, and of course, th there is in the world of computers, especially when you get to AI, a lot of parallel processing. But, well, two things. I guess I'd say, first of all, uh, that that even that draws on von Neumann architecture in the sense that all the processors that are simultaneously processing all the stuff in a massively parallel system, I assume each of those is a von Neumann uh machine in a certain sense, right? All the, all the quote, neurons in a massively parallel system are, are von Neumann, I, I, I would assume, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But the other thing is just uh, von Neumann uh, uh, got into this a little near the end of his life, right? Thinking about the brain and, and the computer and the differences. And, and so I, I guess I just want to let you say anything about this broad subject you want to say. Yeah. So um, it goes back a little bit to um... His his theory of self-reproducing automata. You talked about cellular automata, I think. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and this came out of this um, theory of self-reproducing automata. And he shows in, uh, essentially on, on this um, square grid, uh, the grid has certain rules about um, uh, what's happening in each of these squares. And he showed, you know, there's like 32 different states. And from these 32 different states, he, he sort of began this work but never quite finished it, although, um, and it was finished by uh, by somebody else later after his death. But he was well on the way to showing that if you built up a massive configuration of these squares um, and left them alone, then um, just by the rules of this game, as it were, this grid, they would it would eventually sort of um, kind of snake out a little thread and deposit a new copy of itself on another square. So that was his proof that machines or you know algorithms or whatever could reproduce. So it's kind of the first computer virus and the first um, the first uh, the first proof that machines could make more machines. Mm -hmm. And um, this would his his um, automaton would actually not be run on an actual computer until into the 90s. And even then it would take, um, uh, I think over a full year for it to complete one cycle. Um, although now you can, you, can, uh, you can run a simplified version in a matter of seconds or minutes and, and, uh, and see it reproducing. Now, so he was thinking about this and, and that led him to also consider kind of the human brain and um, in a sense um, you could, um, regard, um, you know, kind of at least the, the the brain as something of an automaton because when it's developing, um, uh, you know, there is no grand blueprint of the brain, right? It starts off simple, and as it grows, it it sends out new connections and stuff, and it's all being built to some sort of plan, but um, you know, it's 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 um, it's not a plan that is clear right from the beginning um, or rather you know the germ of it is there but there is no grand plan that is embedded in the the heart of um, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the neuron it, it just sort of um, ends up the way it is by executing certain instructions repeatedly as it were so that's sort of a you know, cellular aut automaton and that led him to you know ponder quite deeply about um, the brain and automata and uh, the computers that he was helping to build. Now, unfortunately, he gets struck down by cancer. And as unexpectedly, um, and some have suggested that this is because of all the bomb tests that he witnessed, um, some uh, say it's because of his terrible diet. He, he loved to eat. Um, he loved to eat sort of rich uh, sources and um, you know, he drank, <laughs> excuse me, although, um, curiously he never smoked because he realized very early on that smoking was very bad for you and, um, he didn't trust cigarettes, but, but still he, he got cancer and he was in, um, hospital for, for months before he died. And he had agreed to write these series of lectures about the computer and the brain and, um, so whilst he was on his deathbed, he's writing these incredible lectures. And they, for the first time, set out um, what the brain is, makes comparisons between kind of the size of a brain cell and the size of a functional unit of a computer. You know, whether they, then there were sort of, a, um, you know, the valve, the diodes. Um, uh, but it was the first time that those comparisons had been made. and. You know, he says, well, how is it possible that the computer is, you know, each of these, um, each of these components is, um, is so much more reliable in a computer than it is in a brain, you know, and a, 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 mm -hmm. a neuron is not reliable. So um, uh, how, how come the brain is just so much better <laughs> than than these computers? And so that leads him to make these comparisons. And those comparisons remarkably hold, hold up remarkably well. And what he did there was build the first sort of bridge between computer science and neuroscience. And, um, and that bridge is very much in place today. Um, and um, 
in fact, he was very interested in sort of neural networks um, early on. Um, his mm -hmm. prototype of um, the uh, of the von Neumann architecture that was given in terms of these artificial mathematical constructs. Um, these um, these these uh, uh, kind of mathematical constructs. Uh, these sort of fake um, synthetic neurons, which were um, which had been, you know, reported by uh, other mathematicians. So he sort of constructed this computer architecture in terms of these, uh, in, in terms of these neurons. So he was very au fait with this idea of, uh, you know, of, uh, of neural networks. So I think uh, he would have been very comfortable with the AI, um, the artificial intelligence, deep neural nets, kind of of today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, and of course there's the uh, there's his demise, which is probably almost as famous as his um, his attitude towards the Soviet Union and preemptive strike, which is that on his deathbed he has a um, not a conversion, but a reawakening to the Catholic faith, because in fact they had all his family had all converted to uh, Catholicism when they were younger as a way of kind of hoping to avoid um, anti-Semitism. Many, many um, mm -hmm. educated Jewish people in Hungary did the same and, um, and, and elsewhere in, in you know, Germany and so on. It didn't save them, of course. Um, uh, sadly, when um, the Nazis um, came to power at all. But um, there is this incredible and very difficult to reconcile a uh, moment when on his deathbed he asked to speak to um the catholic priest at the hospital and he has these deep com you know conversations with him and um asked for a um uh you know a, a catholic uh funeral the last rites uh, sorry oh, yeah i yeah. said the last rites or the uh, yeah um, I mean, do you do you read that as just kind of Pascal's wager? Like what's to lose if there, you know, even if the chances of an afterlife are only one percent, I'd, I'd like to be there. Or do we have is there any basis for speculating? Yeah, I mean, that is what um, I believe his daughter thought. She couldn't mm -hmm. buy it at all. Um, she thought it was Pascal's wager. And she had um, claims that von Neumann um, uh, told his wife, I think, that Catholicism was a very hard religion to live in, but it was the only one to die in. And so she <laughs> believes that uh, she she believes that it was uh, Pascal's wager. But uh, um, many of his other close friends could never really reconcile themselves with that. And of course, Pascal's wager has you know various logical. Um, problems with it, which you would hope that you know such an <laughs> incredibly rational being might have seen through. Because of course, how do you know you got the right God, right? Because um, uh, if you, yeah, if you, well, you know. <laughs> but still, it's non-zero probability, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, anything compared That's to what, zero. Yeah, I, I think what what the episode shows is, of course, that he was a fallible human being. I mean, he. Love to think his brain was extraordinarily. It was extraordinarily tragic. It was falling apart, and his his daughter, his close friends, just almost could not stand to see him um, and talk to him. As he, as towards the end, he was asking his daughter to give him three digit numbers to to add together, and he was struggling to do it. And this <laughs> loss. Um, <laughs> Some of us would be Tell struggling that, uh, in any event, but uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, uh, Teller, who was his close friend, said he suffered from this loss more than he had seen anybody suffer from um, any loss, mm. really, throughout his mm. life. Um, and so we have this incredibly um, uh, intelligent person who, who's brain is falling apart on them and and they are you know they do something very human in the end they seek comfort um in yeah. god uh, and i i think that's the impression that i came away with yeah
Um, well, uh, an amazing, an amazing person. Um, and, uh, and a great vehicle for a book, just because you can get at so many different ideas through him as you do. Um, so, uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, good luck with the paperback, which in America will, uh, will be out any moment now, um, is, is, is probably already out by the time this airs. Um, the, uh, and is there anything you want to say about what, what else you're doing or where people can reach you or what your Twitter handle is or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> grand desertion of Twitter aside, I'm I'm still there as well as on Mastodon. I'm at Onano, A N A N Y O. Mm. I'm still still there uh, putting stuff out. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I have uh, sadly my publisher is not taking me to the states anytime soon, but you can find um, plenty of podcasts. I did a. Um, uh, book launch with the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which oh. uh, I think may still be on online somewhere. And uh, and you can see uh, von Neumann's daughter um, there as well, who introduces the book and uh, talks a little bit about him. Um, so uh, so there's that. I'm um, and uh, before the paperback comes out, because uh, we're recording this a few weeks, I'll be in India, and then. Um, I am off to uh, Hungary at some point in March um, to launch the Hungarian edition, which is going to be uh, it's oh. very exciting as well, because, of course, he's uh, whilst he's not particularly well known outside of kind of uh, certain cults um, uh, and computer science and economics, um, uh, he is still a national figure, a uh, uh, national figure in Hungary. So that's going to be uh, a lot of fun. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Are you working on another book? Uh, you know what? I my brain was so frazzled after writing this one, and I hope after reading it, uh, you know, readers will will know why. Uh, I mean, I my degree uh, was physics and not mathematics, and uh, as soon as you start getting into math, you realize actually. As a physicist, you only do a tiny, tiny fraction of what mathematicians call mathematics. You know, you're, mo you're mostly doing calculus. You're, uh -huh. you're tinkering at the fringes. You're, doing, you're using the maths that you need. Well, um, <clears throat> getting deep into that and, uh, and trying to explain it fried my brain. So I've given myself um, some time to write a kid's science fiction novel, although oh. I think you will see. Uh, so readers of... Um, the man from the future will certainly see a few of von Neumann's ideas feature in that as well. Um, and okay. um, I'm hoping to finish that off uh, sometime in the next few months. And then, yeah, um, uh, and another sort of nonfiction book, probably history of physics or maths. I have a couple of ideas um, that I'm mm -hmm. knocking around. So, um, yeah, we will see. Yeah. We will see how that goes. All right. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Uh, well, thanks for thanks for taking the time, and we'll we'll thanks see you on much, Twitter bro. and elsewhere. Cheers. Thank you.